Tibet House member video. Originally recorded during the Force for Good class series in January 2016 with Sharon Salzberg and friends. Um, uh, Bodh Gaya, India is the town that's grown up around the descendant of the tree they say the Buddha was sitting under when he became enlightened. So it's an extraordinary place. Um, of course, I have not been there in a very long time, but the things that are extraordinary about it are timeless. So they're from the, you know, the, there's a tree, and there's a stupa temple built just near the tree. And um, as my friend Joseph said, it is such a beautiful structure, that temple. He said it's like commensurate with what happened there, like the Buddha's enlightenment. It is, it, it's really beautiful and I found it a very amazing place. This was a long time ago. Um, and you could actually go and sit all night under the tree like the Bodhisattva did, not with the same results, sadly. <laughs> but you could do that. And uh, it was part of, I think, my whole orientation toward the humanity of the Buddha because it's all right there. Um, oh, that's the place they say he was sitting when he became enlightened. That's the place where he did walking meditation for seven days after his enlightenment. Oh, that's the place. As you know, the legend of the Buddha's life before he became the Buddha, uh, when he was known as a bodhisattva being who was seeking enlightenment, um, he lived for 29 years in the palace uh, with... Uh, tremendous indulgence all of the time. And then after, at the age of 29, he left the palace grounds. You know, this is all like the legend. He left the palace grounds, and he saw an older person and a sick person and a corpse and a mendicant, someone who had renounced the worldly life, seeking spiritual truth. And that was his wake-up call. They're called the four heavenly messengers. And so he left the palace he spent the next six years in extreme self-mortification. A lot of the philosophical schools of India at the time um, held that if you could punish or brutalize your body enough, your spirit would soar free and you would become enlightened. And so he spent six years uh, basically starving and you know, mortifying his body. And, um, and then he came to the conclusion that wasn't the way either. So I think it's interesting as legend, like the power of myth, because it always means something about our own lives. Like, what does it mean now to move from what the culture tells us, which is that extreme indulgence is the way. I don't need just one Toyota with four-wheel drive. I need like five of them, you know? And and then the kind of ways we punish ourselves, if not physically, certainly psychologically, as thinking, oh, if I can put myself down enough, that's a source of, of freedom and liberation. So the Buddha went through those two poles and then came out and said, that's not the way either. And so he ate, he ate a meal. And that's what I was getting to. It's like you're in Bodh Gaya and someone will say, oh, that's where he ate the meal. Somebody offered him uh, milk rice, if you ever go to an Indian restaurant, it's kheer. I always recommend getting the kheer as for dessert, just in case. It's like rice pudding. That was the last thing the Buddha ate, Bodhisattva ate before he became enlightened. Um, you know, so it was something to be there and say, oh, that's where he sat, and that's where he ate, and that's where he, you know, he walked. And uh, it's an extremely powerful, wonderful place. And, and so, too, there's like a circuit, and you can decide, you know, where you where you go, there's um, uh, Rajgir, where the Buddha delivered the fire sermon. You know, the eye is burning, the ear is burning. There's Nalanda, the ruins of Nalanda, which was this huge, wonderful uh, university, monastic university, you know, of all its traditions coming together. And um, there's Lumbini, where he was born. Uh, where I went to Lumbini, there was literally nothing there. And now I think there's all kinds of stuff. Um, there's Kushinagar where he died. You know, so it's a very holy 
kind of um, pilgrimage route. And, and so it's that kind of thing that I think is, is really wonderful. Um, meditation is a, it's a delicate art. And um, you're not going to have the wrong experience. You, you know, you shouldn't think like I'm doing it wrong. Um, many times people have certain ideas about what should happen and those are usually kind of off base and so people often say to me like if I'm meeting them <coughs> for the first time and somebody says I'm a meditation teacher they'll say oh I tried that once I failed at it and then they usually describe what they thought should be happening I failed at it because I couldn't make my mind blank. I couldn't stop my thinking. I couldn't have only beautiful thoughts. I couldn't um, keep sleepiness at bay. I couldn't keep the anxiety from coming up. And we always say, hey, you cannot fail at it. That's not possible. Because meditation, good meditation, is not about what's happening. It's about how we're relating to what's happening. How much presence, how much balance, how much kindness are we bringing to bear on this experience? So that's the point, you know. You don't have to judge your experience or feel that it's wrong or you're doing it wrong, but learning how to relate to it with as much spaciousness and kindness as possible. All that being said, there are also ways in which um, there's such an underlying theme of balance in meditation, and there are ways in which we sometimes have to just adjust the balance. One of the very classical ways we talk about balance is by saying that in meditation practice, we're deepening calm, <clears throat> quiet, relaxation, ease, peace, and we are also strengthening energy, alertness, um, investigation, clarity, right? And those two don't always happen in perfect balance. So my first instinct in hearing your experience is that it sounds a lot like what happens when the calm, quiet, peaceful side of things is really happening, but there's not enough just energy or clarity in one system to match it. And so the first place we go is this state, which is uh, classically known as sinking mind. I call it the ooze. You're just kind of oozing along, and it's very peaceful, and there could be all that imagery, and, but it's just not very sharp. So it's not bad but it's out of balance. Um, in many practices, like with the breath, if you're using awareness of the breath, I've discovered you know, I can be <laughs> in that state for a long time before I notice it. That's one of the reasons why the suggestion is there. Um, if you're using something like the breath to have um, a mental note along with the breath to actually be repeating in out, not just feeling the sensations of the breath, because it'll just inject some more energy. Like I was once at my retreat center, the Insight Meditation Society, I was once, um, the way our retreats go, there's a sitting in the morning after breakfast where there's some instruction and then question and answer. So. It was my turn, and I just got up there, and I closed my eyes. And as soon as I did, I just slipped off into that state. And maybe 20 minutes later, I had the thought, oh, I should you know, maybe do some mental noting, as well as feel the breath. And so I started mentally repeating in and out. And when I did that, it's like the clouds cleared. And I realized I'd been sitting in front of like 100 people for 20 minutes, and they'd been waiting for some instruction. <laughs> and I had just been kind of like spaced out. And um, so I didn't say anything. And then we sat for the rest of the period, and I rang the bell, and then I described what had happened. 
You know, other techniques sometimes, like loving kindness, for example, um, which we're going to end the evening with, they're much more active, they're more verbal. And so if you fall into that state, I find it tends to be obvious sooner because you're using phrases, you're repeating phrases that mean something. And I find that the phrases tend to get garbled if you fall into that state. And then you just know. you know. So maybe you open your eyes. or There are different ways of picking up the energy. So for example, in Burma, sometimes where I, I did my first really intensive loving kindness practice, I'd find myself repeating, may you be filled with suffering. May you not go, no. <laughs> may you be free of suffering. Or, uh, my favorite example of that is um, I have a friend who's Swiss, so English is his fourth language, literally. And he came to the retreat center in Barry once to do a long retreat. And he was doing loving kindness. And his phrases were something like, May I be healthy and well. May I live with ease. And one day, he heard himself repeating, may I be wealthy in hell. <laughs> and may I live with eels. <laughs> but because English is his fourth language, he just kept repeating it. And then he thought, that sounds weird. <laughs> And he kind of flipped all the way back to Swiss German. It was like, oh, you know, I need some energy. So it's just knowing that, you know, some balance in that way would probably be good. To learn about the Tibet House member archives and upcoming Tibet House member trips with geographic expeditions, please visit tibethouse.us. Tashi Dilek, and thanks for watching.